The IRS has never articulated its position on the billions of dollars flowing through tax-exempt U.S. charities into illegal West Bank settlements. And so, when the IRS taxpayer advocate appeared on C-SPAN this week, I asked her why the IRS seems to be facilitating illegal overseas activities. The following video has been edited to include information beyond what appeared live on C-SPAN. DC, go ahead. Hi, for the past 10 years, I've been trying to get a straight answer from the IRS on whether it's illegal to make tax deductible donations to illegal Israeli West Bank settlements. In 2010, I got Commissioner Douglas Shulman on the phone live on NPR. Welcome back. I'm Susan Page of USA Today, sitting in for Diane Rehm. We're talking with Doug Shulman. He's the commissioner of the IRS, the 47th commissioner of the IRS. The IRS collects $2.4 trillion in tax revenue every year. It has 100,000 employees. Um, let's go back to the phones and take another call. We'll go to Grant calling us from Washington, D.C. Grant, thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you. I'd really like to take issue with this idea that the IRS goes after powerful violators. In 2005, USA Today quoted Vice Premier Shimon Peres estimating $50 billion had been raised since 1977 in the U.S. and used to build illegal settlements in Israeli-occupied West Bank territories. And many U.S. charities like the One Israel Fund, American Friends of Judea and Samaria, Christian Friends of Israel, and even Jack Abramoff openly and illegally raised tax-deductible funds in the U.S. for illegal settlements. But while fellow Treasury officials like Stuart Levy and other political appointees supported by APAC aggressively go after Muslim charities suspected of any criminal ties, okay. none of these mm -hmm. charities have ever lost a tax exemption. And uh, the IRS just doesn't go after any of these uh, violators in spite of Obama administration policy against settlements. All right, Grant, thank you for your call. What about uh, Grant's question in terms of does the IRS go after charities who get tax-deductible contributions if their actions then violate U.S. policy? You know, one of the interesting things about uh, the the agency, Susan, is that uh, we actually reach into uh, every nook and cranny of uh, uh, of the country. So we have uh, we focus on individuals serving them and having enforcement programs servicing business. Uh, we also uh, have a tax exempt and government entities uh, section uh, of the IRS that focuses on. Uh, Charities and other nonprofits that get the benefit of tax exemption, making sure that they're complying uh, with the tax rules. Um, we've, uh, over the last 10 years, uh, beefed up uh, that area, focused on uh, everything from small nonprofits, international charities, uh, hospitals, uh, as well as education institutions. And we, we run a pretty robust program to make sure people are complying with the tax laws. Grant said that Muslim charities have been subjected to special scrutiny. Is that the case? Oh, I don't believe so. We um, we try to, as I as I said to one of the earlier callers, um, we are very focused on running a nonpartisan, nonpolitical agency. Uh, there are only two people who are political appointments in the IRS: uh, myself and our chief counsel. The rest of the hundred thousand people you mentioned are career civil servants. Uh, all of us are tasked with focusing on administering the laws that are on the books in an even-handed manner, and I think our track record shows that's what we do. We have a caller who says he is opposed to his tax dollars going to the war in Afghanistan, and can he designate that his tax dollars go for humanitarian use only? What are the options a taxpayer might have if they were opposed to something like the war in Afghanistan? You know, the way the federal government's generally set up is that uh, there are tax rates. Uh, they're debated over time by elected officials, uh, ultimately set by legislation in Congress. Uh, and then there's a whole separate process which runs the allocation of funds. And so uh, people have an obligation to pay their taxes. Uh, they can elect whatever politicians they want to elect who, who are responsible for setting the spending policies, but individuals can't allocate their taxes specifically. Now, we've also had uh, a caller, Basim from Cincinnati, say that I failed to get an answer to Grant's question about if a 
charity with a, that has a tax that accepts tax deductible contributions is for doing something that's illegal. Do you go after them now? There, the the point that Grant was making was charities that may help fund West Bank settlements. What is the case with that? Is that illegal? And would you go after a charity that that was helping to fund that activity? Um, I. I really I don't know uh, the specifics of the case that they brought up. But if I if, if I wasn't clear, um, if someone if a charity is breaking the tax law, uh, is engaged in activities that they're not supposed to be uh, engaged in, we certainly will go after them. Uh, every year we pull 501c3 charity status from a number of, of charities. Um, we've got thousands of audits going on uh, regarding charities. Uh, and so we don't hesitate to administer the tax laws and make sure that, that people are following the rules. And he totally dodged answering the questions. I've paid up to $1,000 to get an official IRS ruling on whether it's legal to deduct charitable contributions to West Bank settlements. Others have tried to get a straight answer. In 2017, a major case against the U.S. Department of Treasury came to an end. A group of plaintiffs that had concerns about Israeli settlements in the West Bank and East Jerusalem because their properties had been taken over by settler groups with the backing of U.S. charitable organizations sued the Department of Treasury and Secretary of Treasury Stephen Mnuchin. They were alleging that the Treasury Department was granting tax-exempt status, uh, 501c3 status, to approximately 200 settlement organizations that were engaged in criminal activities abroad. The judge who was presiding over the case, Christopher James Williamson, uh, was litigating on behalf of the defendants. Uh, Randolph D. Moss was the United States District Judge, ruled that illegal settlements, displacement, and theft of property was, quote, not fairly traceable to government conduct, and that they could not, quote, challenge this as unlawful, unquote. He found that the chain of causation linking the Treasury Department's failure to monitor these groups to uh, linking them to injuries sustained by plaintiffs was, quote, attenuated at best, unquote. So he ruled that the plaintiff's so-called theory of causation was based on speculation and threw the case out. So despite a very detailed effort, a judge in this case, again, Randolph D. Moss threw the case out, and there was never any accountability at the Treasury Department, which does not like to talk about illegal settlements and the billions of dollars being used by U.S. charities uh, for this purpose. But the IRS seems to be part of a problem. It uh, even recently changed its 990 forms to omit destination for such contributions. And from my end, it looks like uh, the IRS colluding in a massive fraud that allows Americans to deduct these contributions in support of illegal activity. So During the reign of IRS Commissioner Douglas Shulman, the IRS took a monumental step backward when it decided that, beginning in 2009, U.S. charities, which are required to file Form IRS 990 every year, a public declaration that anybody could read, no longer had to report overseas recipient organizations or even their country of residence. This massive rule change applied to all organizations conducting transfers to illegal West Bank settlements. Those funding illegal settlements were among the first to take advantage of the IRS rule change, as noted by the Jewish Daily Forward, which reported, quote, that means that an American charity such as One Israel Fund, which in 2003 reported sending tens of thousands of dollars to settlements in the West Bank, now needs only to acknowledge that it sent grants to the Middle East for security, 
among other purposes, as One Israel Fund did in its 2010 filing. Maybe this could be your last mission to get a little accountability at the IRS. Well, I'm not really familiar with that issue specifically, but I can say that in order for you in the U.S. tax system to get to be able to write off a deduction as a charitable contribution, the charity needs to be a 501c3 organization, which means it needs to have come into the IRS and have an exempt let get you know fill out a form 1023, which is an application for tax exempt status, and then get a determination letter from the IRS that says that this is a charity for scientific, educational, you know, charitable purposes and qualifies for um, people to be able to deduct the, uh, their contributions under the Internal Revenue Code. And so unless the settlements, unless there's something else that I'm not aware of, which is always possible, but you know some special law. But unless there is, unless the settlements actually have that determination ruling from the Internal Revenue Service, you can't deduct those things. And that would be true whether it was a settlement in the United States, a settlement in Palestine, a settlement in Israel. It wouldn't really matter. You have to be recognized as a charitable organization under the laws, the U.S. laws, uh, you know, the Internal Revenue Code. Um, and so that would be the starting point. And so I know sometimes what some for over, you know, overseas contributions are difficult. And I will also say that there is a, an organization in Treasury, a unit in Treasury, that looks at terrorist financing. There is indeed a highly secretive unit inside the U.S. Department of Treasury called OTFI, the Office of Terrorism and Financial Intelligence which the Institute for Research Middle Eastern Policy sued to get basic information about who's working there. In 2003, the American Israel Public Affairs Committee and its captive think tank, the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, heavily lobbied the Bush administration to create this treasury unit to go after what have turned out to be mostly targets of the Israeli government that it wished to enact economic warfare and sanctions against. It has, almost without exception, steered away from any Israeli money laundering or illegal activities flowing through the U.S. financial system into illegal settlements. Its officers, such as Under Secretary of Treasury Stuart Levy, are hand-picked by the Israel lobby for their affinity. Levy wrote an entire Harvard thesis about the dream of Zionism. And uh, it's been passed off to different officers, such as David Cohen, who worked with Stuart Levy at a law firm, Levy, Miller, Cassidy, LaRocca, and Lewin, LLP. Uh, it was subsequently handed off to Adam Zubin, a former counsel to Stuart Levy. All of the briefings that they give are typically at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, APAC's think tank. And it's wound up in the hand of hands of one Seagal Pearl Mandecker, an extremely dedicated Zionist who either had or according to Debka file, still has Israeli citizenship. There isn't very much hope for any sort of accountability from OTFI as it continues to battle to halt release of even basic information about its operations and employees. And so some overseas charities, um, people are uncomfortable giving money to even if they can get a even if they don't care about getting a deduction because they don't want to run f afoul. You can't really trace where the money is going once it's overseas and the penalties are very great. But um, some entities overseas create a U.S. corporation that then is a non, you know, like friends of this settlement or something. And in that way, they become recognized as a U.S. charity and you can give money to that U.S. charity. The origin of American Friends of Israel organization are shaky legally and from a regulatory standpoint. But every year, Friends of Israel organizations with few employees in the U.S. and large destinations in Israel send billions upon billions of dollars 
into various activities, some like the Wiseman Institute for Science and Technology have no employees in the U.S. to self-monitor or conduct any oversight. And that may be one of the reasons that it has trafficked in nuclear weapons development and support for Israel's clandestine nuclear weapons program for many decades. The IRS turns a blind eye to Friends of Israel organizations and has even codified in Revenue Ruling 63252 that they can self-regulate. That means the IRS has allowed these organizations with few employees in the U.S. and many in Israel to conduct their own oversight over their own foreign disbursements. And so, as previously mentioned, the IRS has played a major role in cutting its own ability to conduct oversight. Most American friends of organizations with Israeli doppelgangers have no intrinsic social welfare benefit in the U.S. Their only function is to raise money in the United States and transfer it into whatever activities they wish. Um, but I'm really just talking off the top of my head about this because I'm not familiar with the issues. I just, I just have knowledge about tax-exempt organizations in general. I don't know. I'm not trying. I'm, I'm actually not trying to dodge it. I don't think that there's a conspiracy, um, but I do think that this is a very complex area of law. And it's, it's really complex just in terms of overseas charities. We'll head out west to Oregon. This is Jerry. Good morning. The IRS taxpayer advocate may not be in charge of tax-exempt and government organizations. There's a whole division for that. So what happens if you ask that division at the IRS what their official position is on the deductibility of charitable contributions flowing into illegal settlements? Earlier this year, IRMEP filed yet another Freedom of Information Act request to find out. In this snippet of their response, they denied that they even had to process the request, saying, quote, Unfortunately, we're unable to process your request as it does not meet the requirements of the Freedom of Information Act or Internal Revenue Service Code, IRC 6103. In essence, they said the highly specific FOIA didn't reasonably describe the records that were sought. The IRS apparently knows that if it treated such a FOIA as legitimate, rather than saying the request did not reasonably describe the records sought, that the IRS could quickly wind up in court again and have to justify why it refuses to release records it almost certainly has about this issue. As the 2001 Pulitzer Prize winning investigative reporter David K. Johnston told IRMEP for its book, Big Israel, How Israel's Lobby Moves America, quote, a phrase I use in my work and lectures is this, when someone gets a tax break, it shifts the burden of government onto others or onto you, unquote. In this particular case, American taxpayers who are not funding illegal activities overseas must make up for the multi-billion dollar revenue hole created by the IRS's purposeful inaction on charitable contributions to illegal settlements. To learn more about the long and curious history of the Treasury Department and the IRS and Israeli foreign agents, support and assistance to Israeli terrorist organizations, and disinterest in regulatory oversight, read the book, Big Israel, How Israel's Lobby Moves America, Kindle, audiobook, and paperback.